Hello, my name is Maria Jalikar. Welcome to my show, Let's Talk About History. I'm here today at Norwich City Hall, and with me is Norwich's historian, Dale Plummer. And there's going to be a presentation today at Norwich City Hall. Dale, can you tell me about the presentation, please? Well, this is in honor of Abraham Lincoln's birthday, but also uh, to commemorate the First World War. So what we have done is we've asked um, uh, Judge um, Frank Williams from J. Rhode Williams, Island, yes. Frank J. Williams, the Supreme Court, uh, retired Supreme Court Justice from Rhode Island to come and speak about Lincoln and World War I. Although Lincoln had been dead for more than 50 years, people were still thinking a lot about you know, his um, uh, ideals, um, uh, and he was um, certainly much quoted and looked at as an example for the young men and, and women who served our country in World War I. All righty. Okay. Thank you, Dale, very much. So we're going to listen and watch the presentation by um, Frank J. Williams, um, retired Supreme Court Justice from Rhode Island. And I hope you enjoy my show. Thank you. Thank you all for coming. <coughs> I'm Dale Plummer. I'm the city historian for Norwich and also the chair of the uh, Norwich World War I Memorial Committee. Uh, this is a several layer uh, event. <coughs> One of the purposes of this is to celebrate Lincoln's birthday three days early. Um, and we thought it would be it would be valuable to talk about Lincoln and World War One. What you say did Lincoln have to do with World War One? Remember that the Lincoln Memorial was being built starting in 1914 to 1922. Lincoln was pretty much on most Americans' minds, and um, so we asked uh, retired. Chief Justice of the Rhode Island Supreme Court, Frank J. Williams, to come and speak on that topic. Uh, <clears throat> Frank is a noted Lincoln scholar himself. He's written several books. Um, he is a um, remarkable individual. He also was the co-founder of the Lincoln Forum, which meets every year in Gettysburg uh, in November, where they have well-known uh, nationally and internationally known speakers on Lincoln and his times. I've been to several of those, uh, and it is a fabulous event. <clears throat> and we can't thank Frank enough for putting that together. Uh, I think here in Norwich, also Norwich has always had a relationship with Lincoln from 1860 when he came here and spoke. Um, so I thought it would be appropriate. This is also part of our um, Lincoln Forum of Eastern Connecticut, which we've, we've started, uh, again, to honor Lincoln's memory. Um, Mayor, do you want to add any words? Just quickly, a few words. Uh, uh, Dale Mason mentions the Eastern Lincoln Forum. And we started a chapter here about five years ago. And while this event today is also serving as a small fundraiser for our World War I Memorial. It's also a continuation of, of that organization's efforts uh, because we think celebrating Lincoln is a wonderful way to share our own history. And if you follow the Emancipation Bell Project in the Freedom Court that was built out here on the grounds of City Hall, uh, 
and dedicated in 2013, that's an example of how you can create new history and link it with the past and, and celebrate both together. Um, and I can tell you that that David Ruggles Freedom Court um, is actually open to use for any, any purpose. It's not just related to needs defined by the city. Um, we have had remembrance programs out there along with the San Quidosi Court in remembrance of violence in our community and our country. We've had uh, silent memory programs out there. We've had active speakers in the past. Um, we've had, and it is intended to be the People's Court um, to celebrate the history of Norwich with the Underground Railroad, which was very active in our community. Uh, I don't know how many of you know it, but the city of Norwich, um, there was a referendum about abolishment of slavery. It failed across the state of Connecticut, but it passed overwhelmingly here in this city when that was held. This city held a 100-gun cannon salute when Abraham Lincoln presented the Emancipation Proclamation. In fact, in 2013, we recreated that, brought, brought six Civil War cannons here to our harbor and fired 100 volleys across the water. Um, it's also an example of how we can have fun with history as well. And I'll tell you, that was loud. I saw that brown gazebo go straight up off the ground and come back down at first volley. Uh, and there were 99 more to follow. Uh, but we're here tonight to listen to Mr. Williams. And I want to give note that he was one of our main speakers at the dedication of the Emancipation Bell and that project back in 2013. So I know you're in for a real treat. Uh, he is the expert on Lincoln as far as I'm concerned. And we're grateful to have him here so close to us living in Rhode Island. And he's always made himself accessible for us here. So if I may introduce our speaker. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mayor. And Dale, when Dale Plummer calls, I come. Yeah, I'm not really that far from you. I live in the town of Richmond where Hope Valley is located. So uh, it's an easy trek over. And I've been here often, right, Dale? At the, the uh, bicentennial of Lincoln's birth. I think I spoke in um, Norwich Academy. And then as the mayor said, at the bell for the dedication of the emancipation. And I think I was here when, when, um, when the replica of the painting um, was underway because when I came, the original had been stolen. And uh, I still have a reward out for whoever took this treasure. And the banner, of course, uh, I remember when you had replicas. Do you still have replicas of the banner that was used for fundraising? Small, uh, do you even remember that? Do you even, they, they were great. I must have bought them all. Uh, anyway, uh, this, is a, this is a Lincoln City, Norwich. I've said this before, and I'm proud of it because uh, Lincoln came here after he delivered the Cooper Union Address in, in, at Cooper Institute in New York in February 1860 before he was uh, the Republican nominee for president. And then uh, he was so impressive in this hour and a half speech, which made him known to the Northeastern public that he was asked to deliver speeches in Connecticut and. Uh, Rhode Island and New Hampshire. He was on the way to visit his son, Robert, who, who was at uh, Phillips Exeter Academy in southern New Hampshire. And he stopped in Providence to speak and then went north, then came back and went to Woonsocket. Then he came here by rail to Norwich and other towns, Meridian and Hartford, on his way back to um, Illinois, the home state. And then, of course, was nominated uh, as the second Republican uh, to run for the presidency and was elected in a four-way race only by 39% of the vote, thanks to your votes and Rhode Island's votes. And the rest is history, right, Karen? This is what we teach and how, how many stories there are to tell about him 
and about Norwich, your wonderful community that's, uh, that's protected, really. It, you've got a protection here, a belt around it, unlike larger uh, metropolitan areas. So what about the use of Lincoln in World War I? It may surprise you from some of the facts that I tell when uh, Dale asked me to do this. I'm going to try to operate at the, the uh, PowerPoint at the same time. There are very few slides because there are very few posters, sheet music, and other uh, objects used to use Lincoln in uh, patriotism for World War I, but I'm going to try. So from Abraham Lincoln's death in 1865 uh, to the 1922 dedication of his memorial in Washington, different communities, immigrants, native-born Democrats and Republicans, socialists, progressives, anti-progressives, conservatives, women, blacks, southerners, found different meanings uh, in his life and presidency. So we all reacted differently. His 19th century admirers failed to persuade the nation to adore him. That went to General President Ulysses S. Grant. Did you follow me on that? You would think that Lincoln was the hero of our country after he died by an assassin's bullet on April 15, uh, 1865. But the real hero after the mourning that was sure to take place was General and later President Ulysses S. Grant. And he was the number one American until his death in 1885 from lung and throat cancer. And it was only after that period that Lincoln's reputation was on the ascendancy, as you'll see in a minute. Their efforts, the people's efforts, however, laid the basis for his expanded, Lincoln's expanded 20th century reputation. During the Progressive Era from 1890 to the 1920s with social and political reforms, Lincoln's image framed a wider range than ever before. He appeared as the first progressive, embodying the ideals of universal suffrage, temperance, just distribution of income and wealth, fair treatment of labor, and help for the poor. His life and labors justified election reform, anti-corruption legislation, and regional reconciliation, and his moral values justified self-sacrifice and war, keeping in mind that the the latest count for Civil War deaths north and south is 750,000, up from 620,000 because of the use of census records. War weakens routine and causes fear and death. There are many veterans here. Raise your hand. Be recognized. Some of them my fellow Vietnam veterans. Thank you for your service. World War, in addition, threatens national existence and requires universal sacrifice. In wartime, more than ever, people seek orientation by linking present troubles to the challenges of the past. Linked to their national heritage, new forms of authority, cooperation, and sacrifice become meaningful. During America's first great war, World War I, the invocation of Abraham Lincoln's memory aligned America's new geopolitical situation to its deepest political tradition. World War I provided new lessons on how we learn about and distort to the past. Film, magazine, and newspaper accounts of the war and its aftermath raised questions about commemoration and history including partial or complete forgetting of events. Since crisis gives nations their strongest incentive for invoking the past, Abraham Lincoln's function in World War I is worth examining. At no time between 1865 and 1922 did the Lincoln image better lend itself to this purpose. World War I was the pivot of 20th century American history because it transformed the United States 
from a regional to a global power. And Americans explained to themselves this new sense of political responsibility by looking backward. Consider how participants in one primary event, the First World War, interpreted their experience by aligning it to another primary event, the Civil War. Abraham Lincoln was good for thinking about World War I. American nationalism became more aggressive during the war, but the war itself was more than the celebration of aggressive manliness. The moral bent of Americans' martial attitudes made Lincoln the perfect symbol for perceiving and comprehending their first global war. Protestant-inspired moralism, Seymour Lipset has argued, determines the way Americans have always gone to war. To endorse a war and call on people to kill others and die for their country, Americans must define their role in a conflict as being on God's side against Satan for morality against evil. This morality is why American publicists summoned Abraham Lincoln so often during the Great War. All belligerent nations convene their past heroes to mobilize wartime motivation, but not as often as Americans convened Lincoln. Lincoln's face appeared on domestic propaganda literature because it infused the war effort with an egalitarian individualist legacy no other American hero so well embodied. Please excuse this cold and uh, cough that's lingering after three weeks, so uh, be patient with me. His image was most relevant because the generation that fought the Great War lived in an environment filled with his memories. For years, this generation had heard stories idealizing Lincoln and um, making him relevant to domestic political and economic problems. Now it found him relevant to global and military ones too. Thus the patriotic song, Abraham Lincoln, what would you do? Define the war's purpose in terms of the people's debt to Lincoln. Abraham Lincoln, we owe it to you to protect this great country today. That Lincoln represents a guide is evident on this, this sheet music cover, which shows America in her unprecedented predicament, looking up to Lincoln's statue in Hodgenville, Kentucky, the birthplace, or near Hodgenville, the birthplace. Her arms open and receptive uh, to his example. No man represented the cause better than Lincoln, and one song after another invoked him to communicate the war's meaning. Song lyrics interpreted the war by embedding it in the story of the nation. Don't say that all the statesmen died with Lincoln. You'll find we'll still have the power to produce men of honor. America's legacy is secure because its men and women are greater than the crisis they confront. Throughout World War I, the American Revolution and its hero, George Washington, were also recalled. But the Civil War that Jim McPherson, many of us know him as a great Civil War and Lincoln historian, called the Second American Revolution, established the democracy for which the World War I generation fought. Civil War memories include the clearest examples of moral virtue, like endurance in the face of great loss, moral goals, like emancipation and the preservation of the Union, moral values, like equality and dignity of the common man, moral exemplars, like Abraham Lincoln. Thus, the Civil War furnished the themes of American civil religion, 
death, sacrifice, and rebirth, and threw out the Great War's Lincoln's image alone, and joined with George Washington's did legitimize, orient, clarify, inspire, and console the country. World War I established the United States as a world power, not World War II, World War I. But the American experience of the war resulted as much from its unprecedented violence as from its geopolitical consequences. Europeans made sense of the loss of 13 million lives. Get that, 13 million. By viewing the war as a sacred event, their allegorical images, including military versions of the Pieta statues of dead soldiers born in the arms of angels, idealized the war by fusing political and religious sentiments. America's fatalities, 117,000, were relatively light compared to 13 million, but to us veterans, still somber, and to our country, that's about twice the number of our dead in Vietnam at 58,000. Americans realized they were engaged in the greatest war in human history, a war for which no precedent existed, which is why they so often invoke the Civil War the greatest war in American history. The narrative of the Civil War suggests many points of likeness between the America of 1860 to 1865 and that of 1917 when we entered the war, the Great War. There was the same prolonged hesitation as to the moral issues of the war. Looking to the past for the present, everyone needed to know what Lincoln would do if he were alive and president again? How many times do we ask that what if question today? Lincoln, emblem of progressivism, framed the Great War so suitably because the latter, in many important respects, incarnated the spirit of the progressive era. Many progressives opposed the war from beginning to end but most supported it and viewed war preparation through progressive lenses. Assertion of federal power in national affairs and subordination of self-interest to the collective good were as evident in military mobilization as in progressive political ideals. Since the draft conscription was the essence of democracy, it contributed in the long run to social improvement Military training epitomized citizenship training, and fighting Germany abroad was no different morally from fighting corruption, exploitation, and vice at home. Progressives, therefore, stood prominently among the war supporters, and their magazines and journals projected the ideals of the progressive era beyond the domestic scene to the entire world. Just as Lincoln had earlier become a vehicle of progressive reform, he now articulated the meaning of America's military struggle. Images of Lincoln clarified the war by defining the goals of the president, that is Wilson, spelling out the war's purpose and interpreting its suffering. But Woodrow Wilson's problem was his and the public's reluctance to go to war. Hesitation was natural, even after the May 1915 sinking of the Lusitania, because America's interest in the war was problematic. Its experience at waging full-scale foreign war was nil. And they could find no better model than Lincoln, Lincoln for criticizing Wilson's caution. Some members some Americans were eager for war. At length, Wilson asked Congress to declare war, and in June 1917, sent American troops to Europe. As American armies engaged the enemy, Wilson and Lincoln began to look increasingly alike.
Given Wilson's professed appreciation of the common man and disdain for elitism, it seemed right for admirers to compare him with Lincoln. Parallels appeared in congressional addresses, magazines, newspapers, and sermons. Lincoln suffered attacks motivated by meanness and partisan prejudice. So does Wilson. Lincoln was accused of waiting too long to go to war. So was Wilson. Lincoln's war policy was designed to reorder society permanently and prevent future wars. So was Wilson's. Lincoln was magnanimous to his enemies. So is Wilson. Lincoln enlarged the power of the presidency. So has Wilson. Wilson's conduct became more comprehensible when defined as a version of Lincoln's. Recognizing that legal authority is rooted in tradition, Wilson's men called on historical precedent. In the Senate, then, Thomas Hamilton Lewis declared, let the world know that as George Washington fought for democracy as a right to America, and Thomas Jefferson proclaimed it as a necessity to mankind, while Lincoln made it his creed of emancipation for all color and all time, so too Wilson fights for democracy as a right of the whole world. Why should Lincoln's presidency be invoked to begin with? Wilson's supporters knew the difference between the Civil War and the fighting then raging in Europe, and they could have justified his actions simply by arguing that they served the national interest. But they were not trying to perform a technical analysis. Their aim was to connect Wilson's measures to the sacred narrative of our nation. Parallels extended to public information posters defining World War I as an episode in the larger experience of our nation. The triangular appearance of Washington, Lincoln, and Wilson in prints and cartoons, for example, was a regular element in the wartime iconography. In one poster, Washington and Lincoln, America's founder and savior, frame Wilson and the brave boys of 1917. Let's go back. Who extend their forebears legacy to the world. These pictures are frame images, artistic devices that define the meaning of present events by linking them to great and defining events of the past. Toward the same end, the theater made its mock too. Seeking to explain the great success of John Drinkwater's Abraham Lincoln on both the New York and London stages, that's still in print, Literary Digest reviewer observed, we have a well-defined suspicion that if one were to pull the beard from Drinkwater's Abraham Lincoln, he would find Woodrow Wilson. Invoking Lincoln's memory helped legitimize war mobilization. Shortly after the United States entered the war, the U.S. Office of Public Information and Corporations distributed posters carrying the last line of the Gettysburg Address, that government of the people, by the people, and for the people shall not perish from the earth. To save democracy was what the war was about. Orators, printmakers, and cartoonists have always visualized democracy through slavery images. Slavery, the negative term giving freedom and equality their positive sense, is central to America's self-conception and was aligned time and again to World War I. A world divided against itself cannot stand, declared Reverend James Huguet in a sermon titled what would Lincoln say to this generation? He answered the question by paraphrasing the rest of Lincoln's House Divided speech in terms of the present struggle. The world must become all autocratic or all democratic. 
In a new sense, it must become all slave or all free. This is the far-reaching significance of the World War. Just as Lincoln declared that no man is good enough to own another man, so now he would say that no nation is good enough to control the destiny of another. Just as the pro-slavery faction of Lincoln's own time was, in Lincoln's words from the Lincoln-Douglas debates, or one of them, blowing out the moral lights around us, so do those who now invade and oppress neutral nations and endeavor to gain military advantage and ill-won victory by the devices of the savage. Accordingly, on Lincoln Day in 1918, Lincoln's birthday, a state leader aroused great enthusiasm when he asked a Springfield, Illinois gathering, is there any difference in essentials between the enslavement of the Negro and such enslavement as Germany today practices under the gospel of world domination? War information offices worked out the theme the sacredness of egalitarian democracy by showing citizens how to identify with Lincoln. One of their war posters shows Lincoln's first grasping the broomstick he had cut off and held for sculptor Leonard Volk in 1861 for a cast of Lincoln's hands. By purchasing a war bond, very popular, poster, both in World War I and World War II. And I don't have uh, slides of that, but in our collection, in our Frank and Virginia Williams collection, which we've donated to Mississippi State University uh, in Stockville, there is, of course, we have oil paintings from James Montgomery Flagg, who himself was an illustrator and you all remember uh, his I Want You, Uncle Sam recruiting posters. This started in World War I and, course, and of course continued in World War II. By purchasing a war bond, the poster explains, one identifies with Lincoln, for as your hand signs your application for one of these bonds, it becomes the hand of Abraham Lincoln. People who lived through a war costing 170,000 lives and a half million injuries need more than inspiration. They need a theology too. Both enable people to work together continuously and effectively despite the loss. In spring 1917, when the first casualty lists were wired to America from Europe, the media linked them to casualty lists of the past. Civil War veterans were by then old men. But in the words of a poet, lads and striplings they were in the armies that fell in windrows on Antietam's cornfield that was swallowed up, uncounted in the wilderness, that died yet held for all time the stone wall at Cemetery Ridge. Consolation discourse is formulated to make the ultimate loss and death understandable and bearable. One sacred document of the Civil War performed this function. There were others, but this one in particular. Lincoln wrote the document, the Gettysburg Address, for the dedication of a new military cemetery, but its substance was general. As fatalities <coughs> mounted in World War I, the Gettysburg Address grew more popular, and every recitation of it made the war more understandable. The noblest of all Memorial Days, according to the Chicago Daily Tribune editor, was not a 30th of May, but that 19th of November, when President Lincoln journeyed to the Gettysburg battlefield to dedicate its hills still scarred with graves. That World War I was being waged to save democracy was not evident to the nation's black communities. But black loyalty remained nonetheless strong and became stronger when fixed 
on the image of Abraham Lincoln. In churches, schools, and association meetings, Lincoln appeared as a mediator, a bridge connecting the black community to the white nation, a translator expounding national concerns in local terms. In one World War I poster shown here, Lincoln looks down on black soldiers fighting the German enemy. The picture leaves no doubt that the soldiers are fighting in a racially segregated army, and it would remain so until President Truman's executive order after World War II. Their sacrifice for the nation rejecting them, however, is justified by memory of the man who emancipated them. Southern Americans, like African Americans, discovered the meaning of Woodrow Wilson's war by keying it to Lincoln's. Some Southerners committed still to the lost cause, considered Kaiser Wilhelm, not Woodrow Wilson, the new Lincoln. Belgium, they believed, had been raped and pillaged by the Teutonic monster, just as the South had by the Yankee monster. If Belgium had its Louvain and Antwerp, so also had the South its Columbia, its Atlanta, its Savannah, its Charleston. But the maker of this analogy realized he was in the minority. Initiated during the 1909 centennial of Lincoln's birth, Southern reconciliation with Lincoln grew closer during the Great War. In February 1917, Kentucky made Lincoln's birthday a legal holiday. One year later, as American troops fought in Europe, the Virginia legislature officially observed Lincoln's birthday. The typical Southerner may have been ready to concede to Lincoln an important symbolic role, yet that role was not the same in the South that it was in the North. For Southerners, Lincoln stood more plainly for union than for democracy. When on the 50th anniversary of Lincoln's assassination in 1915, President Woodrow Wilson ordered the lowering of flags throughout the United States, Southern newspapers commented on the occasion and praised Lincoln for holding the country together. Victorious war and its symbols strengthened the state. The fully successful functioning of a nation state in turn demands and receives an incandescent level of adoration. Abraham Lincoln's commemoration made the American state glow more brightly than ever. In 1922, the federal government dedicated the Lincoln Memorial as a monument to America's greatness and to what Lincoln had contributed to it. People were also tirelessly reading about Lincoln. Throughout the 1920s, the number of popular magazine articles about him remained high. Throughout the 1920s, Lincoln symbolized political power and centralization. Yet conservatives, as well as reformers, quoted and embraced him. His face adorned campaign posters and song sheets. The greater Lincoln became, the more expansive his role as a model for society. To say, as did New York's Governor Whitman, that the Republican Party must conduct itself so that it tallies and squares itself with the life example and manhood of Abraham Lincoln is to say something simple and on the surface uninspiring but it reflects perfectly the era's exalted conception of Lincoln. To Lincolnize America was then a well understood phrase. Recognizing the, grow up, the growing power of the motion picture industry, civic leaders urged movie makers to strengthen their nation's morals by inducing viewers to look at all questions of America through Lincoln's eyes. When an Ohio judge answered the call to Lincolnize the country by recommending a year-long course on Lincoln at, at a, as a high school requirement, 
Educators took him seriously. Good going, Judge. That Charles Evans Hughes urged college courses on Lincoln in order to reinforce the character of young students also made sense. As Secretary of State Hughes explained, in making Lincoln the exemplar of the nation, we are not merely recognizing heroic service, but we are safeguarding our most vital resource. So long as we cherish Lincoln's principles, and so long as his virtues inspire our youth, our security, and progress us assured. Between April 6, 1917, the U.S. declaration of war against Germany, and November 11, 1918, the armistice, of course, that we've just celebrated the centennial, Abraham Lincoln framed a nation's war experience. His memory did not glorify the war or conceal its horror as have other World War commemorations. It formulated the war's meaning. His memory helped to legitimize the president's assumption of war powers, prepare the population to fight, clarify the ideals and values at stake in the war, and justify its injuries and deaths. The American people legitimized and oriented their actions, affirmed their values, and inspired and consoled one another in many ways. Lincoln's commemoration was but one part of making war comprehensible. Although Americans at war could invoke many events from their 18th and 19th century history, they chose the Civil War most often because it was the nation's defining moment, the moment that shaped and fixed the identity of generations. Makers of Civil War and Lincoln images could therefore count on their audience's capacity to appreciate their work. That the World War I generation so readily found itself in Lincoln is, uh, defines the power of his image. If Lincoln's image had been hollow, a symbolic residue left over from the previous century, then the popularity of new Lincoln biographies, songs, dramas, and films, and the great volume of newspaper and magazine articles about him immediately before and during the war would be unexplainable. Common memories of Lincoln constituted common models for acting, common ideals for judging, common categories of understanding, common sources of inspiration, common interpretations of suffering and death. As a model for society, Abraham Lincoln was more than a unifying image of the moment. He was part of something deeper and more permanent, part of the soul of American society. Thank you all very much. We have some time for questions, right, Mayor? Yeah, absolutely. Anybody like to ask a question? Yeah. Um, Microphone. <coughs> when, when I was growing up, every civics teacher I had said that Ulysses S. Grant was one of the worst presidents in American history. So as, as Lincoln became a senator, Something happened to Grant uh, in his image. And I was just wondering, you know, when you said, which was new to me, that Grant was actually the hero for a long time after the Civil War, and only when the World War II, you know, impetus came around did Lincoln begin to be resurrected. So what, what happened to Grant's image? Well, first of all, I have to disclose that I'm also the president of the Ulysses S. Grant Association. <laughs> so, uh, but I'm not going to recuse myself yeah. as I would on the bench. Uh, I'm very proud of the fact that Grant uh, has now regained some of the luster of his reputation. Uh, two springs ago, C-SPAN ran its... Uh, um, survey of American presidents 
and the one before that had Grant like at 31, and in this survey, he's at 21. So he's already gaining. Uh, and I might add that too, and if you don't have it on your Christmas list or holiday list for December or your birthday, do it. The new biography of Grant by Ron Chernow, he of Hamilton fame and Washington fame, is absolutely superb as is the one that came out two years or a year before Ron White's uh, Ulysses. And uh, Gene Edward Baker did one a few years ago, and Joan Waugh did one on uh, the Grant's reputation. So these are all contributing to putting Grant in the context of his times in which he was, despite the corruption that surrounded him by close members of his presidential family, that's what brought him down. The Teapot Dome, uh, the, the, the uh, scandal of trading licenses and uh, uh, the tax on, on alcoholic beverages uh, with insider trading. Um, and of course, it's been proven time and time again that Grant had no direct contact with this, with this, with these scandals, but his judgment was certainly short-sighted in his trusting some of his old wartime colleagues, mm -hmm. like his own secretary. That's what really did it. And I think as the war receded in American memory and his importance as a victor, as, as a real strategist, uh, despite the casualties, uh, I think uh, helped diminish his, um, his uh, role as president and commander in chief. But what, what happened was the inverse for Lincoln. As this time went on and people were looking at Lincoln's words as being beyond the war, the Civil War, and having lasting, like the Gettysburg Address or his second inaugural, uh, that, that contextually his reputation once again or began to really increase to where it is now. Right. So I think that that's the short and simple annals that, that I can relate to you. But I high, I'm high on Grant, uh, all the good, the bad, and the ugly. Uh, and we all have that, you know, in our own leadership roles, as did Lincoln. Someone else. Thank you. Uh, uh, two point question if I could. Uh, first is that Wilson was a Virginian and I wonder if there's anything that you've come across that shows what Wilson thought of Lincoln and any public utterances about it. And then the other would be the common people of the South who were trying to, you know, Lincoln's presence as a motivator for the North and for African Americans, you pointed out today, for World War I. I wonder in World War I if they couldn't see Lincoln as that kind of rallying figure? Do they look to their own Civil War iconography for heroes to you know, summon their manhood to go fight? Well, very much the lost cause in the South. In fact, it's still there now, right? With uh, the fight over Confederate monuments that uh, there's, a, there's a big move to relocate them or destroy them, which I think is a mistake because it is part of our history, even if, even if on the wrong side. And then um, Wilson grew up in Georgia. He also spent time, his father was a reverend. His, he spent time in Columbia, South Carolina. So what do you suppose his upbringing was? It was pro-South, pro lost pro cause. He was a segregationist. Uh, and you weren't going to get the, a Truman executive order from him integrating the U.S. colored troops, as they were in the Civil War, called the U.S. colored troops. Um, and he, you know, he's, he was one um, who, who had a screening of Griffith's Birth of a Nation in the White House. And that's racist. If you look at it now, you can get it uh, on disc, on uh, DVD. Uh, and it, it applauded the Ku Klux Klan and other supremacist, white supremacist groups. And uh, 
uh, demonized uh, African Americans. And so he was all part of that culture. Even Lincoln, to an extent, was part of that culture, uh, except he was able to grow beyond it and evolve, like with the Emancipation Proclamation that you commemorate out here in the front of your city hall, uh, and that um, he knew that the war had more meaning than just victory over the South and reconciliation, if that could ever happen, uh, that it had consequences for um, world democracy, which Lincoln was very much into. So um, it's a sad feature of our history, but one that I think should be um, explained and discussed openly and candidly, uh, because my view was that, you know, I'm a mediator now, that's what I do. I'm failing in retirement because I keep showing up. But, and I say that only because there's one thing that could not be mediated, and that's when that first Dutch slave vessel came into Virginia in, I think, 1619. Forget it, it was over. It was only a matter of time, and this isn't just from the benefit of, of our history and looking backwards. It was only a matter of time before we would have to confront this violence violently. And that's what happened in our Civil War, despite the Missouri Compromise, the turbulent 1850s, the, the, the uh, Compromise of 1850, and uh, John Brown's raid. All of these things all just propelled us towards uh, to April 12, 1861, with the firing on Fort Sumter. The tug, as Lincoln said, the tug has to come, had to come, and it's come now. And as he said in the second inaugural, and the war came. I have a question. Yes. After the assassination, <coughs> after the assassination of a President Lincoln, um, his vice president took over as um, acting president, but there was a gentleman from Connecticut, Foster, that took over as vice president, I believe. He's from Norwich. Yes. His Lafayette home is on NFA's property. Foster. Yeah. And he had a law office right here on Main Street. Um, how long after the assassination of President Lincoln did the war continue? And do you know anything about Foster from Norwich? and his role as vice president, how he was nominated. Well, the, um, how long did the war continue after Lincoln's assassination? The war is still going on now. Uh, this is why we need that, that reconciliation that Lincoln uh, wanted sooner than later. And um, why even our courts, and I'm embarrassed to tell you this, even our courts betrayed the public, especially African Americans, by not upholding the intent of the Civil War Amendments, the 13th, which is final freedom, the 14th, which is due process and equal protection, and the 15th, which is not to deny the vote to anyone, any American. And uh, it took, and all of us, uh, most of us were alive in the 1960s, it took the assassination of John Kennedy and the gumption of Lyndon Johnson, a Texan and Southerner, to really have the testicular fortitude to push through a new Civil Rights Act to and guarantee and see the, to the enforcement of it. So that's number one. Number two, I don't even know who this Foster is. <laughs> and, and under the Constitution, you don't have another vice president after the, um, the death of whether in office or, or um, through, unfortunately, assassination. There have been four of them. Um, the president of the Senate is the, is the next in line for the presidency, or at least it was then. Now, I will say this as a Lincoln man. One of the worst mistakes Lincoln ever made was in acquiescing in the choice of Andrew Johnson to be his running mate in 1864. Now, he didn't know that he would be, in two months, he would be killed. But this is what we got. 
a, a, a white supremacist from Tennessee who was the military war governor who had no regard for African Americans, no regard for white Southern planters, but certainly not for the rights of, of uh, black people. And uh, we paid dearly for that. And that was the that's really what we call the re reconstruction period, which is going on right now as a sesquicentennial, 1865 to 1877 when Hayes was inaugurated because there was a sellout the Northern people were tired of having U.S. troops still in the South to keep order and to, and to prosecute under a new Department of Justice um, against, white, uh, against the violence by white supremacist groups uh, uh, with lynchings and other intimidation of uh, blacks. So that was that period. And then we had the period from 1877 to the 1960s uh, which we're still now uh, dealing with. So that essentially is a short course um, in what I think was our dilemma with the loss of Lincoln. Now he, now Lincoln, as clever a politician uh, as he was, and uh, a being a good man as he was, and having a moral virtue, which he did, was not going to end this crunch with uh, African Americans if he served out his second term. He could have done with his judgment and his ability to mediate, which he was doing with the Congress, he could have, br bring, he could have brought us to a lot closer to where we should have been uh, in 1868 or 69. Someone else. Did I get it right, Karen? You did. Mayor, you're great. No wonder why they have elected you. You were here early getting the food out. You were here moving the dais and the platform. And the last time you and I met in, in 2013, you were about to be defeated and knew it. And we talked about it. And we talked about the Lincoln example. And why, this is why I love the phrase attributed to Lincoln, that we have this right to rise because we have this right for second chances and third chances, and you're an example of it. Congratulations. And congratulations for your service. We should have more people in public service, in the military, everywhere, planning boards, school committees, because that's what keeps our democracy going. We have a shortage of that. Maybe not in Norwich, but at least nationally, we have a real problem to commitment to public service. And in, in keeping with your comment about claims uh, to rise, I'm, I'm, a, I'm outside of this community. I'm from a, a neighboring town called Madison, and I've begun to, to learn about Norwich and its really extraordinary history and its role in um, civil rights and the abolitionist movement. Um, and I, I just, I'm just curious, really be beginning to become more familiar with such a progressive and historically rich community that really walk the walk and talks the talk, as I've experienced. It's a really genuine welcoming. Um, how do you put a figure like Trump into context, um, given what he symbolizes for um, a really forward-thinking city like Norwich, and as an example to um, young African Americans. The only philosophical response I can give to that is that this too shall pass, and that uh, fortunately we have elections every four years for the office of president, and we have another one coming up in uh, less than two years, I think. And uh, that, and and keep in mind that it's the people who elected him, which is scary because 50% of the people, give or take, a half of one percent, whatever, uh, saw something that um, we didn't see, or I certainly you didn't see uh, here. Um, I do not like the man. 
Uh, one, one time when Mario Cuomo was considering running for office, and we were all friends, a whole group of us, and we were young and full of fire and vigor, and um, I, I had my office picked out in the White House. Actually, it was in the Pentagon. I wanted to be Secretary of the Army. Um, I don't think I would work for this person if I were offered the Secretary of Defense. So uh, we have to just endure it. Uh, I think there's a real question whether he finishes his first tour. Uh, I'm scared about the running for the second tour, uh, the number of Democratic candidates. I'm not being political here. I'm just trying to speak in the sense and the context of history, uh, even though it affects us contemporarily. Um, so there's a real question here, and I think um, I think we have to just wait it out. We have to be patient, which is not our big characteristic. Americans are not patient. And we need to, we need to um, see what we can do. There are still many who believe that he's done a great job. Uh, so we have to confront um, this reality and not run from it. I don't even know if that's an answer or not because I don't have an answer, a complete answer. Someone else? Anyone else? Well, I hate to end it on such a note <laughs> as this, as presidential politics. Yes, Marvin, what's up with you? Thank you, Your Honor. I had a uh, question for you. It was a Civil War question. I didn't realize you were going to couple the Civil War with World War I. It's very fitting. I just finished a documentary on World War I, and it's my type of documentary. It's very boring and full of facts. <laughs> and so um, your numbers, thank you for that. But just to boost it a little bit, it's 20 million if you include the civilians. They basically lost a whole generation in Europe. It was, it was very, very empty. Listen to the song, Where Have All the Young Men Gone? But my question is, I've seen a lot... Um, uh, I had the opportunity to work with somebody who was related to Professor Harrell from Virginia Military Institute, and he wrote a few books on the Civil War. And um, is it still up in the air? I'm curious about Dr. Mudd. What is the, what is the final conclusion on Dr. Mudd? It's rather important. Guilty. To, okay, I agree. Here's the problem with Dr. Mudd, and I, I was friends with his grandson, Dr. Richard Mudd, who was an in-house physician for General Motors in Detroit. And he, along with many of the other Mudd family members, worked hard to get the U.S. District Courts and the, the Army Board of Corrections, that is, to correct military records, to reverse this finding by a military tribunal after Lincoln's assassination, he was one of the defendants, found guilty, sentenced to Fort Jefferson in the Dry Tortugas, and then released um, when he helped the prison guards and other prisoners overcome yellow fever. I think it was 68, 1868. But Mudd lived in Southern Maryland, which was pro-Secesh, pro-Southern. It was where the contraband traveled across the Potomac. It was where messages, intelligence, and so on. Uh, and Mudd was part of that, that line, that, that um, uh, underground line. And when federal troops finally followed Booth's trail, it led to Mudd's home. And Mudd treated him for a, a broken leg. And um, he denied knowing Booth, but the, the two had been acquaintances for two years. That lie killed him. Uh, and he, you know, he, he, it he would have been better off if, um, if he had told the truth. But that's, that's what happened. So the, 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 the bottom, the upshot was neither the U.S. District Court nor the Army Board of Corrections would, would change the, the verdict or would would find some uh, excable pot for Dr. Mudd. 
What's that? Well, he said he couldn't exonerate him because he wasn't in charge of the Army Board of Corrections or the U.S. District Court. But President Carter said he believed in Mudd's innocence. Well, we can say that all we want, but it doesn't have, as you all know, the vacating of the, of the guilty finding, which happens many times when there's new evidence and people ask for corrections of their, of their sentences in both uh, our criminal court system in Connecticut, Rhode Island, or the federal system. Thank you all very much. You've been great. Thanks. Thank you all for being here. Uh, to wrap up on this floor, Tom has agreed to play a song for us. It's a song that he wrote himself. As you know, he was the first state troubadour here in the state of Connecticut. I believe 16 have since followed, or 17. I can't quite get the number, but um, he's the, the original and the best. Thanks, Peter. So we're going to move on and get this out of your way here. Can you give us a minute, Tom? Oh, you're going to get out of my way? I know you're a Marine and I'm Army, but I ask you to defer. I okay. ask you to defer. I won't tell you to double time. Yeah, okay. <laughs> you know about this Marine Army uh, rivalry that we've had? Since we it's a home. myth. It's a myth. Good. <laughs> We're all on the same team. That's right. Is this a mic live? Do you know if this mic is live? Yes, it's on off. Just push that off. Good. Let me get this out of the way. Okay. Tom, uh, you know about this Marine Army rivalry that we had? Oh, my name could be mine. <laughs> Very good. <laughs> Are you good, Doc? No, I got it here. Just take it out. Okay, thank you very much. Appreciate it. You can do my tech. Mm. It's great to be here. Tom Callinan's my name. I was the first official of state troop door here in Connecticut. Live here in Norwich, and um, a couple years ago, Dale Plummer, our esteemed historian, came by while I was working in the yard and said, We have to do something about uh, this cannon. And uh, I said, How about hello? And then, it's, Oh, hello. And um, so I've been ribbing him about that for a couple of years now. Uh, the howitzer, I got a buzz here. This buzz? No, it's the coffee machine. The coffee machine. Interested in, in this. My great uncle was killed in Chateau Thierry in 1918 in France. Um, so I've been very interested in following up on World War I activities called the War to End All Wars, the Great War or the War for Civilization. Wrong on all counts. Right on Chelsea Parade Displayed as a trophy Of the Great War Where her son's sacrifices were made It came to the city in 26 As a post-war request by the Legion